a real pleasure to be in this beautiful country. Um, I'm not that competitive, but I think it, it might be almost as beautiful as the country I come from. <laughs> Certainly the second country I come from, and that's my first Trump joke. <laughs> ah. oh, okay. yeah. Great, cheers. Ah, all right, great, super. That may also be my last Trump joke. Uh, we'll see. I am a, a genetic engineer, and it's, it's really wonderful to share a stage with so many of uh, my colleagues and collaborators over the years. And as a genetic engineer, all of my professional life, I'm a practitioner of the art. I believe that, as a genetic engineer, it's appropriate and right to assess the risks of biotechnologies, of the products of biotechnologies. And I also think that the way in which I would do a risk assessment is informed by how these products are made. And therefore, I'm an adv advocate of doing risk assessment based on the processes behind their development. And I'm going to talk about an emerging class of genetically modified organisms that, uh, for which, I believe, there are gaps in our ability to do an appropriate risk assessment. Among these different emerging technologies, you've already had a wonderful introduction by Patrick. Uh, some of these are called by various names, the new genetic engineering technologies, the new breeding techniques, genome editing, and RNAi, or RNA silencing, RNA interference. One of the elements that unites most of the applications of these techniques is the use of small stretches of nucleotides called oligonucleotides. And these oligonucleotides inspire or direct the reactions that are involved in these kinds of modifications, whether it be a reaction in which, such as with CRISPR-Cas9 or the ZFNs as you heard earlier, uh, involve also the associated use of modified or associated proteins given to a cell, or in the case of RNA interference, where the small oligonucleotide uses endogenous proteins to create the change that was intended. What also unites all of these techniques is that they create unintended or off-target effects. And these are, of course, an important part of, how, of what we want to discover uh, in a risk assessment when we look at these products. Now, several speakers have used the word precision when it comes to these techniques. And they're using the word precision as I would use the word efficient. So these small oligonucleotides focus and target the reaction, and thus give it, in a sense, a biochemical specificity. That small oligonucleotide, in a non-random way, chooses where the reaction will occur. However, the interactions of that small oligonucleotide are not precise in the way I would use the word, because each one of those nucleotides in that oligonucleotide can use the properties of base pairing to associate with other very similar sequences within a genome. And they also then cause that unintended non-target alteration with high efficiency. So our previous means of introducing mutations meant that it was unlikely that any particular secondary effect or mutation was going to be present in that genome. Not impossible, but far less likely that you could pick two cells from a mix and that they would have the same combination of intended and unintended changes. But with these new technologies, the efficiencies of the reactions are high. And thus, if one of those unintended changes results in an adverse effect, the probability of choosing it goes up many fold. And that's why I think it remains important for us, regardless of what we're calling these new technologies, to focus our efforts on doing proper risk assessments. The main emphasis of my talk today is about these double-stranded RNAs, which result in a growing jargon of types of, of uh, reactions that you've probably heard of, um, but they're all based on double-stranded RNA. And this growing list of, uh, uh, this growing jargon includes things like PTGS, post-transcriptional gene silencing, 
RNAi for RNA interference, and many other kinds of names. So when you see these names, ultimately it's a story about double-stranded RNA and what it is doing to create a change, uh, sometimes intended and sometimes unintended, in an organism. These double-stranded RNAs also have lots of different names, but ultimately, for the most part, we can confine ourselves to uh, what they do as double-stranded RNAs. So you may have heard terms like SI RNAs, MI RNAs, hairpins, short hairpins. All of these are forms of double-stranded RNA that are relevant to the story today. And this, this uh, structure you see here, this is a structure, whether it's in a molecule of this size or in a longer molecule, that has the features that are important for the modification of the, of the trait, and that is this double-stranded region. And when RNA is double-stranded, it takes on qualities that single-stranded RNA doesn't. And one of the most important qualities is that it becomes a gene regulator. Normally, or most frequently, we see the effects of this as a gene silencing. That's not the exclusive way in which it works, but it is the common way, and most of the newly modified crops using this form of modification uh, are intended to cause a gene silencing. Most of us are aware of RNA in its single-stranded form, where it's used, oops, where it's used as a messenger. And messenger RNA is that intermediate between the DNA genome and protein production through reactions called translation involving multi-protein complexes like ribosomes. In the case of double-stranded RNA, where the double-stranded RNA is used by endogenous um, complexes of proteins, such as argonaut proteins, the RNA becomes a gene regulator and it can regulate or silence genes through three different pathways, two of which are shown here. One way is called translation inhibition, where the molecule in some fashion or another inhibits initiation of translation and therefore decreases the amount of that target protein, uh, but it, it preserves the integrity of the messenger RNA. A second effect is RNA degradation where the double-stranded RNA directs activities to that target messenger RNA that results in its degradation. And this is the strongest form of RNAi, or RNA silencing. A third form directs that double-stranded RNA to the nucleus, where the DNA genes reside in eukaryotic organisms, which results in a decrease of transcription, so a decrease in the production of that mRNA itself. There's been a number of products over the years which, intentionally or not, were based on the effects of double-stranded RNA. The first food product to be modified, the Flavor Saver Tomato, was retrospectively understood to be an RNAi phenomenon. It was intended to be simply an antisense shutdown of, of, of um, the protein production, and only well after it was off market did uh, it be revealed that it was through an RNA interference process by which it was working, telling us that these technologies hop, skip, and jump beyond our understanding of the biochemistry of what's happening in these cells. This here is a dated list of various uh, types of crops that have been based on double-stranded RNA silencing. Added to this list now would be the uh, Arctic apple, which is meant to decrease the rate of browning, and a new potato, which is meant to reduce the uh, accumulation of products that result during certain kinds of cooking of the potato, of the potato into um, Maillard reaction products like acrylamide. So we've seen this before, Though each time these go through a regulatory authority, the regulatory authority acknowledges that there are incomplete understandings of the biochemistry of how RNA silencing works. Up and coming are two new kinds of products based on double-stranded RNA, and these are generally plant uh, protection products. One of these involves 
targeting a pest when it eats the plant. The, the uh, pest that's being targeted takes in a double-stranded RNA produced by the plant, which is toxic to that insect. Now in this case, shown here, a corn plant produced by Monsanto, the double-stranded RNA is produced by inserting a transgene into the genome, which is meant to produce that double-stranded RNA in some form, which ultimately, when ingested by the animal, is further converted by its endogenous RNAi interference pathway into a toxic form. The difference, as you can see, oops, using the wrong one. Uh, the difference, as you can see, is that the unmodified plant is predated, the modified plant is less predated, and that's the difference between a live uh, target pest and a dead one. So ingestion of double-stranded RNA, exposures via ingestion of double-stranded RNA, can have severe physiological impacts. In this case, that severe physiological impact is the intended outcome of the modification. The question remains, though, do off-target effects in non-target organisms, including those that may eat the dead bodies of these uh, pests, are those known? How would we predict them? And would we care? Now, there's uh, a considerable amount of investment in these double-stranded RNA uh, technologies. This type of pesticidal plant has already benefited from significant input from the private sector. But a new development is one that I would like to draw your attention to as being perhaps one of those that is most likely to come to a town near yours because there is debate about whether this technology technically produces genetically modified organisms. And in this case, the double-stranded RNA is encapsulated in a chemical formulation, say in the form of a herbicide, which is then sprayed onto fields in some form or another. Over breakfast, I understood that here in Switzerland, uh, you still spray pesticides from airplanes. So you can imagine what might happen here with double-stranded RNA being released um, from, uh, at large quantities from automated types of things like airplanes. Now what you see in uh, this example here, the BioDirect technology from Monsanto, this is uh, a type of weed that is now invading the US at high rates in its cropping systems, corn and soy, uh, Palmer amaranth, which is, a, a ter which is resistant to glyphosate, or their Roundup product. And what they have done is incorporated a double-stranded RNA that silences the gene that makes Palmer amaranth resistant to their herbicide. So that in combination with their herbicide, the double-stranded RNA and the toxic form of the herbicide now kills that weed. So that sounds like a nice thing. But this is an actual in-field transformation of these plants. These small oligonucleotides are directly transferred into the interior of the cell of these plants. And the chemical formulation is what makes that possible. Which means that anything not intended to be exposed to that chemical formulation can also serve as a vehicle for the movement of those nucleic acids into unintended recipients. Hence, the risk assessment would logically include any other kind of organism that may be exposed to that pathway. But importantly, because this is RNA and not DNA, the argument, the technical argument is that these aren't genes and therefore they're not subject to our regulation despite having absolutely substantially equivalent risk scenarios. And thus, that's why I wanted to bring them to your attention, because some companies and some scientists are of the view that this technicality means that they don't have to report this to you, and they don't have to subject it to the same kind of regulation as that corn plant I showed you in the slide before. There are many different exposure pathways that have been demonstrated to be physiologically effective in animals and plants. For example, if you create a plant that produces a double-stranded RNA and graft it to another plant, so a tree, a fruit tree, you have one that's producing a double-stranded RNA that gives you the silencing effect that you're after. 
you graft that branch onto another recipient tree, in some cases, the effect systemically moves throughout the tree. So it infectiously moves from the, from the modified branch to the unmodified tree, or from the rootstock. It is transmissible to some animals directly through soaking. In this case, if you take things like worms, put them in a Petri dish, which is just in liquid, regular old buffer with double-stranded RNA, the RNA can cross the epidermal barriers, enter the cell, and be systemically transmitted throughout the uh, animal. As I've already shown you, it's transmissible through food. And in some cases, at least, and in some animals at least, that transmission by any of those pathways is as effective in the germline for the inheritance of the effect as direct injection of the double-stranded RNA into the sex cells. And in some organisms, the inheritable effect has been maintained for upwards of 200 generations. Just think what your family looked like 200 generations ago. <laughs> there is controversy about its effects on people and its potential for effects on people. Nevertheless, that controversy is not an excuse to ignore risk assessment. And there are a growing body of papers that show it can be relevant to humans and physiologically relevant to humans through ingestion. And I say this because, I say ingestion because, it's probably the least likely way it could affect us. That inhalation, contact, are probably far more likely uh, exposure pathways for humans that are physiologically relevant, but nobody studies those. So we're left with just looking at the least likely effect, which is ingestion. And there is not decisive, but accumulating evidence that ingestion is a relevant exposure pathway for novel double-stranded RNAs, they're novel to us, they're not ind indigenously produced by our cells and our genomes, and which might nevertheless have targets within our genomes. This was the first paper, substantial paper, to demonstrate the potential for physiological effect, particularly in mammals. And what you see here on the upper left is a list of microRNAs, that's some of these double-stranded RNAs, that are produced by plants. These microRNAs were found in statistically significant quantities in human serum, mouse serum, and calf serum when those animals or those people ate the plants that produced them. So it is evidence that dietary double-stranded RNAs, at least some of them, and in quantities that reflect some kind of species predilection, can be taken up into the blood, and once taken up into the blood, have the potential to be systematically transferred throughout the body. In this case, the focus was, focus was on one of those double-stranded RNAs, the 168A, which has a sequence similarity to a protein called the LDL RAP1, the low density lipoprotein receptor adapter protein one, which I don't need any further introduction on. You all are familiar with your LDL uh, RAP1. But the important thing is it's a liver protein. And what this group found is that the sequence, the DNA sequence of this small double-stranded RNA had significant similarity with a region of LDL, LDL RAP1 receptor uh, protein. They further found that when they introduced this small double-stranded RNA into human tissue culture cells, it caused the down-regulation of expression of that protein, telling us that the plant version was physiologically effective for use in human cells. An RNA identical but sequence different RNA had no obvious effect. If they fed mice a meal that was uh, seeded with this microRNA, the ingestion of it alone was sufficient to cause a reduction in the production of LDL RAP1 in the liver of the mouse. So it could be distributed systematically through the blood to the target organ. 
Now, as I mentioned, these double-stranded RNAs can have off-target effects. And this is one of the things that makes them important for a risk assessment. One of the ways in which they work, say through that RNA degradation pathway, can result in the production of secondary double-stranded RNAs, and this is well known. In effect, then, such as this study had shown, that five different double-stranded RNA molecules, all targeted to the same gene, collectively silenced 840 genes. And possibly the reason for that is this, is this amplification pathway. So each of those different double-stranded RNAs, uh, uh, microRNAs, or siRNAs, result in the production of further double-stranded RNAs, each of which can be recruited to amplify the initial silencing reaction. But each of those will be sequence unique, and thus can all find different genes within the genome for which they start to have an interaction. Okay. And it's not just humans. Our, our gut cells secrete double-stranded RNAs. This recent study indicates that we do so to farm different kinds of microbes in different parts of our gut. Those double-stranded RNAs specifically enhance the growth of different kinds of microbes. And that's what's shown here. Here's two different kinds of uh, bacteria and specific double-stranded RNAs that our gut produces. Now, if we're introducing, through the form of biotechnology, a double-stranded RNA that has the effect of enhancing the growth say, of something we don't want in our gut, and it survives to the gut, then we can also be farming things we don't want in our gut. And that's why it's important to know where these double-stranded RNAs may come from and what we might target in our risk assessment. The regulators, at least my regulator, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, uh, doesn't agree. And we have chronicled over the years their response to our uh, hypotheses about this uh, double-stranded RNA. And they said, emphatically, the scientific evidence does not support the theory of these RNA molecules and that it couldn't last through food. But of course, I've shown you results from the peer-reviewed scientific literature that shows exactly the opposite. So they weren't in engaging in the precautionary principle and asking for rigorous risk assessment. They were denying the presence or potential for risk based on their own assumptions. Even a scientific advisory panel to the US EPA disagreed with my regulator in Australia, and it has said in a landmark white paper that we cannot dismiss the potential even for ingestion-based exposures to novel double-stranded RNAs. They need to be tested for safety. A tweet from my uh, regulator was, we don't always science, but when we do, we food science. Personally, I think they should have left it as, we don't always science. <laughs> so in summary, double-stranded RNA is a ubiquitous gene expression regulator. Its effects can be heritable once instigated in many different kinds of organisms, though not all organisms show this potential, at least so far. It has an amazing capacity for infectious spread, and it can have many off-target unintended effects. There is scientific evidence for plausible exposure pathways of double-stranded RNA, novel double-stranded RNAs, including through food and inhalation. Contact transmission uh, to environmental, environmentally important animals and plants is uh, something that is actually being engineered into the new generation of pesticides. These can affect such animals and plants, and therefore I believe specific testing is necessary. Thank you very much.